Hi, Karen. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing well. Yeah, so it's very nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. Looking yeah. forward to this. Yeah, me too. Uh, so today my guest is Karen Smilowitz. She's the James N. and Margie M. Krabs Professor in Industrial Engineering and Management Science at Northwestern University with a joint appointment in the Operations Group at the Kellogg School of Management. Karen is an expert in modeling and solution approaches for logistics and transportation systems in both commercial and non-profit applications. She has been instrumental in promoting the use of OR within the humanitarian and non-profit sectors through the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the National Academy of Engineering, as well as other various media outlets. Karen is an author of a number of scientific papers published in highly prestigious journals, and she is the editor-in-chief of Transportation Science. In 2022, she was elected an INFORMS Fellow for Outstanding Research in Transportation, Logistics and Nonprofit Operation, Significant Contributions to the Practice of OR for Social Good and Advancing Equity and Diversity. Karen, such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, so let's start. Uh, where are you from in the US? Uh, so I was born in New York, in Queens, and I grew up in New Jersey. Okay. Uh, are your parents or grandparents immigrants? Nope, no. Nope. Uh, going back the generation before my parents, but my grandparents, but otherwise New Yorkers for a long time. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what were your parents' occupations? Uh, so, my dad was a pharmaceutical salesman, and my mom was a high school math teacher. Okay. Uh, Okay, so you mentioned your father uh, was a pharmaceutical salesman. I, I wonder if he had to solve a TSP back in the day. <laughs> it's funny because I do bring my dad up in my uh, supply chain classes, but not for the TSP, but for uh, when we talk about periodic inventory review. And students will say, well, don't, you know, with RFID, don't you constantly know your inventory levels? And I tell them I have these very vivid memories as a kid and my dad having warehouse inventory weekends where they would go and just assess the inventory in these enormous uh, pharmaceutical warehouses. So he does come up in my classes, but not for the TSP. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to be a joke, but <laughs> no. it, it turned out to be uh, uh, actually uh, uh, interesting uh, in fact that you just said. So, um, yeah, are you an only child? No, I have an older sister. What did you do? So uh, my sister's interesting because we um, were very different interests growing up, um, very different college majors, and we both started our PhDs the same year. So she uh, is a medical physicist and she is um, faculty and clinician at uh, University of Wisconsin. Ah, okay. So she has a PhD then, like you, as you said. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, your parents should be really proud, right? <laughs> it was really neat to have that you know experience together as we were going through our PhDs. Ah, very nice. Uh, so, uh, Karen, you you grew up during the seventies and eighties. Don't worry, I'm not giving away your age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what are your most fond memories of that period, and how did you used to spend time in, in those days? Um, you know, it's funny. Speaking of transportation, we were just talking about something about New York City, and I can think about how far we, we talk about how far we've come in transportation. I have these vivid memories of driving through New York City, my parents' old hatchback, where my sister and I would just be lying in the back, no no seat belts, not even in a seat, and just looking at up at all the lights of of New York. Uh, so those are some vivid memories. Um, a very avid Lego fan far later than was socially acceptable. I played with Legos and even now, you know, when my kids started getting into Legos, it was a really great uh, reconnection with Legos for me. Right. Uh, were you a shy kid? I was. I was. I think that uh, it took me a while to come out of my shell. My mom would always sort of push me to uh, come out of my shell. I, I, and I do it now with my kids where they don't want to make the phone call to order food or to schedule something. And I remember my mom always pushing me to, to be out there a little more. Yeah. Uh, did you take part of any sports activity or anything in this sense? I did. Um, 
I would say I participated a lot. Uh, <laughs> I would say I was very good. Uh, but I played soccer. I ran uh, track and cross country. And uh, wow, do you still stay physically active? I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, during the pandemic, I got one of those. Uh, so I used to do a spin class here on campus, and then during the pandemic, I got a bike at home, and so that's kind of my my morning routine: exercise, then walk my dog. Yeah. Uh, not bad. Uh, what about music? Did you play any instrument and what type of music you used to listen to at that time? Um, this is just a funny walk through my childhood because similar to sports, yes, I played an instrument, but not well. Um, I played piano and cello, uh, but was not particularly good. Either uh -huh. one. Um, so I, while I played instruments and wasn't very good, I listened to, you know, growing up, in the 80s and 70s and 80s, I listened to a lot of Bruce Springsteen. Um, I'm going to see him this summer again at Wrigley, which is great because, uh, you know, I've, and now I've seen him on both coasts, uh, both in grad school at Berkeley and growing up uh, on the East Coast. And now I'm going to see him here in the Midwest. So that'll be fun. Yeah, that's great. I know that some uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen's fans are really diehard fans, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We used to celebrate his birthday in college. Yeah, <laughs> you grew up in New Jersey. I wonder if you also like Bon Jovi because, you know, he's from there. And... Yeah, I would say I like Bon Jovi, but I'm not a diehard fan like ah, I am. Okay, first. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, my, when I was a kid like in, during the 80s, uh, I remember that my, my brother, he had this cassette of that album that is called New Jersey by Bon Jovi. So there uh -huh. some yeah. songs that, yeah, yeah. So it brings me a lot of memories, yeah. Uh, so I know you, you mentioned that you used to go to New York. Did you take advantage of that? Like, you know, if seeing from the cultural perspective, you know, going to you know, theaters, movies. We did. Yeah, I was just talking to my mom about this because we would go to see shows all the time. And it was great, you know, seeing Cats and Les Mis and, um, you know, I thought Annie was probably the first show that I saw on Broadway. Uh, and so it's neat now to take my kids. I took them to Hamilton. We just saw Book of Mormon two weeks ago. So that was just fantastic to have all of that so close. Is it true that you were a Star Wars fan? Of course, yes. Um, a big Star Wars fan. Um, I can remember uh, one of the movies we saw at a drive through a drive-in movie theater uh, with my dad. And it was great. Um, and actually, my son, so apparently Return of the Jedi is coming back to the theaters. My son is going to go tomorrow night to see Return of the Jedi with his friends in the theater. Yeah, do you have but any? We, my husband and I spent a lot of time thinking about the order in which we were going to introduce the movies to our boys. And it's kind of neat now. And there's something, I forgot what, the machete order. I think that's what it's called, where you do um, New Hope, so episode four. Then you do Empire, and then right at the end, when they reveal that Darth Vader is Luke's father, hopefully that's not a spoiler for anyone listening to <laughs> the podcast. I just ruined it. Um, then you go back to, you skip episode one because it's terrible, but then you do episode two and three, so you get to the backstory and you end with, and episode three is really good, I think, at least the last five mm -hmm. minutes of it. And then you kind of get that yeah, whole yeah. Russian uh, yeah. from Anakin and Darth Vader. Right, yeah, that, the final scene is uh, memorable. Uh, of the third yes. uh, movie, and so you, you're not a fan of Jaja Binks, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so don't. No. And my favorite Star Wars movie, I would say, is Rogue One. I think Rogue uh -huh. One is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Empire Strikes Back, obviously. I think you have to say that's your favorite. Um, but Rogue One is is just amazing. Yeah. Wow. So you're into the Star Wars franchise quite quite a bit then. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Wow. Um, were you into books? That's a little deeper than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so were you into books? I was, yeah. I read a lot as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's neat now, again, like I think all of these things, you, you now experience them again with your children. So like when my son was reading The Outsiders, uh, that was great. And then uh, that short story, which I ruined for him, The Dangerous Game, this this podcast is going to be all spoilers. But I was like, oh, that's the one where they, they it turns out they're hunting people. And he was like, we hadn't got to that part, Mom. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, any favorite authors? Um, I think as I got older, Margaret Atwood, probably, uh, Toni Morrison. Uh, yeah, I, I read a lot as a kid. I really, you know, it's interesting to think like the way your career goes. And in some ways, I really think I could have just done a PhD in literature and really 
enjoyed it. Wow. Uh, what were your favorite subjects in school then? I suppose literature was one of them. Yeah, yeah, and definitely even in college, which I really appreciated. Um, so, you know, as an undergraduate at Princeton, we really had an opportunity to take um, classes in arts and sciences. And so I did take a lot of literature classes, Russian literature, children's literature, and it was amazing. And just to be taught by these incredible scholars was just such well, a Well, you took Russian literature then. Uh, did. Yeah, did you read yeah. like Tolstoy, Dostoyevsky, and those books? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, I suppose you liked math too in school? I, oh, yes, and I did like math too. <laughs> <laughs> And math. Physics? <laughs> math, physics. Did not like chemistry. Uh -huh. um, and it's funny, my son now is uh, taking chemistry. And also, I think that somehow that's genetic. Uh, he loves the physics and not the chemistry. So, yeah, I liked physics and, um, and all my math classes. Okay. Uh, what made you decide uh, to study engineering at Princeton University? Um, I think it was my how much I, I enjoyed math and physics. Um, and, you know, at the time I, I went to Princeton to study civil engineering, um, particularly environmental engineering. And I think it was pretty common in the early 90s. A lot of uh, students were really interested in, say, you know, I can remember my first reduce, reuse, recycle mug, right? And so getting into um, environmental engineering and then went and discovered it's a lot of chemistry. Um, <laughs> and, and then I took um, probably my first linear algebra class. And that was incredible. And, uh, you know, I had a, a math professor that taught linear algebra who would say, now go home and practice on your favorite matrix. And that just kind of stuck me. I'm like, we have favorite matrices. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it, it's interesting. I, and at the time, civil engineering and operations research were in one department at Princeton. So it was kind of an easy pivot to have enrolled in, in civil engineering and then kind of evolved into operations research. Mm, yeah, so that was exactly my next question. When and how did you discover OR? Mm -hmm. So I took um, a class in transportation. And so my advisor at the time was a freshman. And so my advisor was not necessarily my field. I think he was an electrical engineer. And there was a transportation systems class taught by Alan Kornhauser. And my advisor was, well, but if you don't end up doing transportation this is an unrestricted elective it won't count for anything are you sure you want to do this so it looks really interesting i want to take it um and it was great and uh, you know alan ended up being my th senior thesis advisor and that i mean all these years later that is my career so i think it was a good choice so sometimes you know i encourage students to follow their path even if their advisor says not to <laughs> and do you remember what was your impression when you know saw the, the OR for the first time. I mean, uh, did that have an impact on you? Well, it took a while for you to grasp uh, its potential. Right, I mean, it was kind of neat because I think my classes really took, you know, showed the two parts of OR. So transportation showed the applications and kind of what is possible in terms of what we can do with OR. But then there was also these amazing um, methodology classes. And I can remember taking statistics with Richard DeVoe and my network flows with Leslie Hall. And, and it was just um, Bob, Bob Vanderby taught my optimization class. So you start seeing from a methodological perspective um, what you can do and, and how it all comes together is really neat. Yeah, so usually uh, OR is associated with industrial engineering, computer science, applied math, but not that much with civil engineering or envir environmental engineering, right? Uh, so do you think that the interdisciplinary nature of OR somehow keeps us hidden? Yeah, and, and it is that's an interesting point that you make, because I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I really did come to OR through through civil entering through the application side of it um so for me it's kind of always been together um and and you know how do we do that more for our students so they can really see the applications uh and i think that's kind of exciting in terms of moving forward how do we keep that focus how do we really you know uh make the case for the value of or mm -hmm. and what was your first or project so my first big OR project was probably my senior thesis at, at college. So um, I did, uh, it was the airline market share model. There was an F in there. I forgot what the, because it was the AMFM model was the cute title of my uh, my senior thesis. And so um, my advisor, Alan Kornhauser, had done some work um, applying kind of the 
theories of quantum energy to freight transportation. And the idea being, you know, different modes of transportation existed on different levels. And then the exchange was kind of jumping up energy levels. And so I, kind of, I took a similar perspective in terms of what this meant for airline market share when there were um, shift between carriers. I haven't thought about my senior thesis in a very long time. You could take it off the shelf, but mm -hmm. I think it is over there somewhere. Uh, be embarrassed to read it, but uh, but it was a, you know just having that experience as a as a senior of writing a thesis was really neat. Right. Uh... My really good friend at the time was a German major and was writing a paper on uh, Virginia. There was a uh, Virginia, not Virginia Woolf, but a. German poet whose name is similar to that. And so I can have these memories of being, you know, working on our district, our theses that were so completely different, but uh, it was really fun. Yeah. Uh, what did you do after graduating? Did you go straight to grad school? I did not. I went to consulting for a couple of years. Um, it was a good experience for me. You know, we had talked earlier. I was probably a pretty shy, um, shy kid. And so consulting kind of helped me come out of my shell more and really helped me think about how to how to take quantitative work and present it in a more generally accessible way. Um, so I worked up in Boston, but during this time, I was also keeping in touch with Alan Kornhauser with my thesis advisor. And so he at some point I, I knew I wanted to go back for my PhD. And he's like, well, why don't you come back, work for my company in Princeton? And you can also work on your applications for grad school at the time. And so that's what I did. I went back and worked for ALK Associates with Alan and then prepare for grad school. Mm -hmm. Uh, why did you go to the West Coast for higher studies? <laughs> um, yeah, that was a big move, you know, having grown up on the East Coast. I spent one summer in Atlanta as an undergrad, but otherwise, you know, it was pretty much in the Northeast. And uh, it was it was Carlos Daganzo, uh, my advisor, you know, just talking to him and um, all of his students, we all have versions of the story where he says in his really great Spanish accent, and I'm not going to do that on the podcast, uh, but I will teach you things nobody else can. And it's, it was just really exciting, you know, having been out of school for a couple of years and really excited to go back. And Carlos just lured me back to, to Berkeley. Yeah. So he said like, very, very good, Karen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what uh, are the main differences between Princeton and Berkeley from your perspective? Um, you know, I think I did it in the right order because Princeton is a very undergraduate focused experience. It was just phenomenal. And I think, you know, for me as an undergrad, it was really just so, um, it was just an exciting place to be. There were so much, um, there was so much to do. My mom actually, there was a really neat interview with Brooke Shields once. And so if you remember Brooke Shields yes. was, you know, a movie star and she she stepped back and went to Princeton for four years and she was being interviewed and she and someone said like, do you feel like that hurt your career? And she said, no, I feel like I stole those four years. It was amazing. And, uh, and so, and I, I feel the same way because, you know, there's a lot of similarities between me and Brooke Shields, of course, <laughs> um, but I feel that same way. It was just four years where you just get to learn so much in the whole world. Like I just, you know, the suburban New Jersey kid, and then you go to Princeton and I learned it just, like I said, opened up the whole world. Um, so that was just, and, but, but also it's a small enough environment that I feel safe to, to do all this. And then you go to Berkeley and it is just, um, a whole different ball game, very focused on graduate school, which is also incredible um, to have made friends who were studying very different uh, fields, but also just uh, there was just so much going on at Berkeley. It was really exciting. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is in making that move to the West Coast. So when I was at ALK Associates, they were just coming out with some of the very early in vehicle navigation. And so, so Alan said, well, why don't you test it out? If you're driving across the, the country, we want to see how it, it goes. So, and back then it was a laptop. We had a laptop and then we had this GPS device that we would put on the roof of the car while we were driving. And, you know, I remember my friend and I, actually the same friend who wrote her thesis with me, uh, driving out and we would disagree with the navigation and, and she, this voice on the computer would get so mad at us. Uh, but it was so much fun. And then once we got to San Francisco, we took it down Lombard Street just to see how it could handle, um, you know, changes of elevation and all of that. It was really fun. Wow. So yeah, you mean, yeah, it's a, a, one of the early experiences using GPS. Uh, yeah, very, very yeah. interesting. Uh, 
Tell me about uh, your first research activities uh, during your PhD. So uh, when I first started at Berkeley, I did uh, work with Carlos on traffic flow theory. So we did a really interesting study for those of your listeners who are from the West Coast, the Bay Area of San Pablo Dam Road. So it's it's a pretty um, busy commuter route into um, uh, Berkeley, uh, but it's a single lane. So it was a really neat place to study uh, traffic dynamics. And so what we did is we took Carlos's car with it had a bike on top so we could um, monitor it. And we were looking at the way that delays propagate. So we could introduce our own delays into it. Uh, and so we had students with laptops throughout, you know, uh, the stretch that we were studying, we were collecting information and, and counting cars. So it was a really, it was my first um, experience with uh, running a, a traffic experiment. It was really fun. Uh -huh. uh, One of the really interesting things about it is that, you know, as we were analyzing the data and kind of going through all this, I found what I really liked was the logistics of it all. And I said, like, this is my first experience with uh, running an experiment and thinking about how, how do you kind of go through everything that could go wrong? You've got this one shot and you want to have redundancies in the system. And and that at that point was like, you know, I, I like this, but maybe my heart is really more in the logistics of it all. Yeah. So you actually like planning the experiment uh, more than experiment itself. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. What an and that's really way. when there was a pivot in my research and I started working more on logistics and less mm -hmm. on traffic flow theory. Yeah, it's a, an unusual way to uh, find your passion. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but And it's certainly now as editor-in-chief in, of transportation science, I'm glad I had that experience. It's nice. To, and also have that experience of being both in civil engineering and industrial engineering because, you know, that's one of our goals at the journal is making sure that this is the home to all outstanding research in transportation science, whether you are in an industrial engineering department, a civil engineering department, a computer science department, a business school, that we can really bring in people from all these different fields. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, later, you ended up working on continuous approximation and discrete optimization, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of worked with, with my two advisors. So with Carlos, I did a lot with continuous approximation, and then I also worked with Albert Adam Turk in IUR. And so that was a really nice compliment to be able to think about as we have different approaches to, um, in, you know, in this case, it was the design of package delivery networks. How do we use them as complements and not to say, okay, there's one approach and then there's another and you don't necessarily bring them together. So that was really cool. Yeah. Can you elaborate more on how you used each approach, like continuous appro approximation first, then discrete optimization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that the advantages of continuous approximation is really looking at these high level strategic decisions, right? So how do we think about, you know, when you're making big decisions about, you know, my dissertation was looking at integrating um, both your express air network and your deferred truck network at the, at the last mile, right? So where are there places where you have these synergies between the networks and are there, is it, you know, even to just ask questions like, is this even worth it? You know, I think about my first PhD student here who did work on periodic vehicle routing and service choice. And so again, with his work, using continuous approximation to ask these really high level questions of, is this really something to go deeper in? Are the, you know, just at a rough estimate, are the cost savings going to um, offset the complexity of doing some system integration? So it's more like a strategic some... level uh, in this mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And then once you make these strategic level decisions, then at that point, it really is you, you want to get more into the discrete modeling and to really think about how do I make these tactical um, or operational decisions. At that point, you pivot away from continuous approximation and get more into uh, discrete optimization. Mm -hmm. When it comes to implementing discrete optimization algorithms, uh, one has to be really good at coding. And how was it in your case? You come from civil engineering. That's why I, I'm, I'm very curious to know how did you manage to, to learn how to code? Oh, and, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And I can remember, you know, being the civil engineer hanging out in the IUR wing at, at Berkeley at Echeverry and feeling like I had something to prove. You know, I, I just felt like ever at this point, you know, we were programming in C and using the Cplex callable libraries. And I felt like this is something everyone knew. And so I crammed to make sure that I could do this, um, you know, for the work that I was doing with Alper. And I worked so hard and I, you know, 
it was really, really hard at the time. And then when I came to Northwestern, I got an email from one of Albert's students who said, oh, I hear that you're the expert on this. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought everyone could do this. So it was just kind of funny to, to see like what drives us and how, you know, how do we find that balance where our insecurities drive us to, to do well, but don't paralyze us with, with fear. Yeah. You know, when you work with the Callable Library and uh, start adding cuts of your own, uh, there's an overhead there, you know, learning curve, even if you're from computer science or even industrial engineering, even applied math, whatever, uh, you have to combine uh, many skills in order to put that into practice. So yeah. it's very challenging. So you don't, you should not feel bad that you're coming from civil engineering, it, yeah. it, it, regardless I mean, of where you come, it's there's... challenging. It isn't just that there's a learning curve. I think sometimes there's this barrier at first because you don't even know how to start. And so feeling like, you know, with my students, getting them to think about, you can ask the stupid questions at first. It's okay if you've never seen this interface before and you don't even know how to do this, right? So sometimes it's even just, if you haven't even had that experience of programming at all, it can be really scary. And so I see students who just immediately assume they can't do it. And if you kind of give them, hold their hand in the beginning, then they just take off. You know, it's just that they don't even know that they can do it because it seems so far in it. And I think we do our, our field a disservice by using so much jargon at the beginning and, and really making it seem like it's not accessible. And once people feel comfortable and get over that hump, they can do amazing things. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, you should try to be more, uh, let's say, student friendly, if you will, when it comes yeah. to uh, 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 introducing some terms some technical terms from yeah. our field. Yeah, so so they don't get really scared or uh, intimidated. And I see it with my own boys, like they when they were younger programming in Scratch or was it Lego Mine? I forgot what it is. Lego has some uh, robot that you can program. And the tremendous advantage they have going forward, right? It's not to say that they're STEM geniuses, they just happen to have access to toys that let them program. And so if you are, you know, I, I really worry the way that we gender toys for kids, right? Is that like when I was a little kid, Legos were Legos, right? And we all just played with the same Legos. Now they have Legos and they have Lego friends for girls. Well, the Lego friends, they're terrible. They're very few pieces. They're not very complex. They don't have the programming to it. And so we end up giving kids, some kids this amazing advantage, this leg up because they've been programming since they were seven and others have not been programming with their toys. And they come to college and we're like, well, you're so dumb. You don't know that. No, they're not dumb. They just play with different toys because we gender toys too much. And so I think that we really need to get back to um, really thinking about the, the, insidious ways we start this and, and what that means going forward yeah these are all very interesting uh insights uh i think this analogy with lego it's pretty interesting yeah right yeah uh tell me about your first conferences were you nervous of course <laughs> i was incredibly nervous um, i was incredibly nervous and i'm from new jersey so it's a bad combination because I talk really fast, particularly when I'm nervous. And so my first presentation was um, you know, back in the day, it was the transparencies. We had an overhead projector and the transparencies. And so it was a paper I had written uh, for a class with uh, Summer Madna. And so Summer was flipping the slides for me. And so we tried to flip them really slowly because he was trying to get me to slow down because I was just talking a mile a minute. So he would take the slides and go like this. And I just would look over him like, what are you doing? We have to go. It was really funny. Yeah, so really concerned about uh, the time. But y y so you, you ended up really doing the presentation super fast. Uh, oh, I think it was, the presentation was probably five minutes. Tops. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, we have been discussing about this introduction to, to uh, OR uh, from the computational perspective and how it can be intimidating. Uh, when we go to conferences and you want, we want to be introduced to, to, you know, to some of the stars or people that we know only by the papers, uh, uh, that from people that are really known and we basically are familiar with their work, but we feel somewhat uh, shy and even discouraged to go and approach them. Uh, and uh, what is your take on, on this? Yeah, I think it's so, you know, I can remember um, 
just certainly just people smiling when I was an assistant professor or PhD student and how much it meant to me, you know, to see particularly some of the, the women who were a couple of years ahead of me and forming friends with them because there was just this warmth um, that I really, really appreciated. And, you know, something like the Subject to podcast, I think is fantastic because you now can introduce all these junior researchers to, to people in our field. And then they could maybe say like, oh yeah, I also like Bruce Springsteen, you know? So thinking about how do we find those commonalities so that it's a little less intimidating? Um, because sometimes it's kind of, you know, it, it's scary to think about, you know, how do I first just start a conversation? But if there's something that you remember about them uh, from, from something like this podcast, it's really nice. Yeah, because sometimes you are uh, concerned of speaking something dumb or something that might make you feel embarrassed. And, and yeah. then if you like start a conversation with some, uh, you know, topic that is more uh, less technical, uh, yeah. so to speak, uh, it might yeah. be more, uh, you know, constructive or even productive for the person who's talking to that star or that famous person yeah. for the first time, right? Absolutely, and, and I would say not even just the first time, but the second time, don't be afraid to reintroduce yourself. Because I think that some students are like, oh my God, they don't remember me. Um, but I can say that, first of all, getting older. And second, with my kids, my job, there's a million things in my head. And so when you see someone out of context, you might, it might take you a second to remember who they are. So don't be afraid to say, you know, oh, I'm Karen Smilowitz, we met last week. You know, it's fine. It's, it, I always appreciate it because I find it hard sometimes to think quickly, like, wait a minute, how do I remember? know this person? Yeah. Was it easy? Uh, for you to find a job after completing your PhD? So um, I, I was an interesting one when I was looking for my first PhD position. Now, like you hear, is it industry or academia? Is it business school versus engineering? I was in, the, is it civil engineering or IE, which was kind of a, a, a different take on, on it. So I looked at both. Um, and, you know, the way that I found my position here at Northwestern is that, um, uh, Carlos, my advisor, had reached out to Mark Daskin about civil engineering if they were hiring. And Mark said, civil's not hiring, but we're hiring an IE. And so um, that's how I came to apply here. And then um, I really, at the end, came down to a decision between the civil engineering department and, and IE here in uh, Northwestern. And uh, and I felt like this was a place where my students would have, you know, the set of tools, like, you know, kind of talking about being able to use multiple methods to approach these problems. So I, I really like the department and it's been great to be here ever since. Mm -hmm. So now you had to teach. How was it? <laughs> um, it was good. It was good. It was, um, you know, I my first class was my supply chain class, and I probably told the story about my dad and the inventory counting in pharmaceutical sales. Uh, it was a, yeah, a junior, senior supply chain class, and I still keep in touch with two of the students. Um, Callie got her PhD at Georgia Tech, and we keep in touch, and then another student is on our business adv or our advisory committee here, so it's been really nice. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about your research contributions of the last 20 years, uh, starting with your work on the period VRP. Mm -hmm. So the work on period vehicle routing was really neat because it was really my first nonprofit operations project. It was, and um, you know, I my dissertation was on on freight transportation when I came here. I started working on on freight, and then there was a nonprofit uh, uh, interlibrary loan organization, so a state funded nonprofit that came to us for that needed help on um, on their routing. They were it was at the time where the economy was a little slow. And so what happens in libraries is that people tend to use the library more when the economy is slowing than buying books and their state funded agency. So their budget was going down. So their volume was going up, uh, budget going down. And so we started working with them on routing. And it originally just started with some undergraduates, you know, is this, you know, can we just apply what we know? And then my first PhD student started working on it because we started looking at, well, what if we not only think about changing the routes, but how frequently they go to uh, visit the libraries. And so that became the PVRP with, with service choice. And it was really a neat study because in this, this setting, 
they, you know, oftentimes when we talk about nonprofit operations, we think about they have less resources. So how do we do more with less? But it actually was the case where they had a little more flexibility in terms of how often they visited the libraries. You know, if your customers are paying for a certain level of service, you're going to give them that service. When they're not paying, then you can think about, well, what if we change the service to be better in line with our operations? And that uh, ended up becoming Peter's dissertation, which was great. Very nice. And how to come up with solutions that are sustainable for nonprofit organizations, such as uh, the library you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really important because the library we, we um, the service we were working with, they actually had um, providers come to them and give them software that could do all of their routing. But once the providers left, you know, then they were like, well, it's really good for mapping. We use the maps, but we don't know how to use the tool otherwise. And so really thinking about um, how do you come up with, with ideas that are both easy to implement, but also really good. And I always think back to the work of John Bartholdi, uh, did some work with uh, Meals on Wheels um, in Atlanta many, many years ago. And we're able to show that just by using, a, then it was a Rolodex, if you remember Rolodex, <laughs> and a map of Atlanta, they were able to find solutions within 10% of optimality. And so it was something that the um, the beneficiary, the Wheels on Wheels, could, could easily do, but it came up with really high quality solutions. And I feel like that's always kind of our North Star in the work that I do with nonprofits is how do we, and then it requires both skills, right? Because you need to show, if you want to think about, is this within 10% of optimality, you need a way to find out what optimal is. You don't necessarily need to give that to the beneficiary you're working with, but to be able to bound your solutions, you need to do that work. And so um, I think that's always been a fun challenge uh, for me and for my students. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about your work related to humanitarian and nonprofit operations? Yeah, sure. And I think it goes off the same theme of how do we think about coming up with solutions that really work with the, that are, work with the organization are going to be implemented. Um, and and that really, I think, if we can fast forward from my first uh, PhD student to my most recent student right now and her work um, with public school districts. So we are working with a public school district on. Um, this is so this is public schools in Evanston and uh, like many uh, communities in the US in the 60s when the schools were desegregated, they were desegregated by closing schools in the predominantly black neighborhoods and busing students through white neighborhoods. And unfortunately, that has really stayed the model here in Evanston. And there was a growing call within the community to address this, to say the burden of desegregating our schools should not be on the black students. And so we had been working with the school district for a long time on transportation, on bus routing. And when the new superintendent came in with a, a mand, I mean, really his goal, his push was to create a school back in, in the neighborhood that was closed. Uh, we started building models for them to mm -hmm. look at, you know, what would this be in terms of uh, the, the reassigning, the uh, redistricting of the boundaries. And it was a great experience because it really needed to be done with the community. It wasn't going to help them if we had an optimization model and said, oh, here's your solution, because we don't know all of the factors and that's certainly not going to be implemented. There's so much that so much context and it really needed to be community driven. You know, we're trying to address what happened in the 60s when the communities were not involved. So now you need to make sure that you have models that are really transparent. And so it wasn't just coming up with solutions with the community, but it was building the models with them. And that and, and my student, Izu, has just done an amazing job of thinking about uh, this what she calls the stream-based formulation, which is basically a composite variable formulation for school districting. So in, in the traditionally the way school districting is done is, you know, you live in a certain area, you're assigned to a school. But now the, what the community really wanted was this continuity of schools. So what is my elementary school? What is my middle school? What is my high school? If for a re some reason I need special programming, am I going to a school with that special programming that will feed into the same middle school? So her composite variable looks at all of these decisions at once. So it's just, she's done amazing work at thinking about how do we model something that we can also communicate with the community and build it with them. And so uh, last year, the um, school board uh, voted and this is moving forward and there's going to be a new school here at Evanston. Yeah, that's very exciting. Uh, how to model uh, the fairness aspect in this context? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's a really hard one because, you know, I always use the example, if you just look at some of these like variation metrics, variational metrics, you just give everyone nothing, right? <laughs> and that's fair. Um, so, you know, how do you come up with the way, you know, we can talk about equity and fairness and kind of as, as human beings talk about what we think is desirable, but now you need to give it to a computer. And so that I think has just always been a really, to me, interesting challenge of how do we find solutions that are equitable, but also make efficient use of, of resources. And, and it's really fun. It's one of my favorite things to teach because I love taking students through the exercise and I do it with my engineering students. I do it with my MBAs and it's really fun to get them to think about, you know, particularly not just fairness, but fairness and outcomes, right? So fairness in input, like, okay, I have a resource and I want to divide it fairly. You know, we could do that. But now how do you start to model the impact of that input on different populations? How do you think about actually moving from just fair uh, input, but fair outcomes? It's a lot harder. Um, and so it's really fun um, throughout, you know, in a class to kind of get the students to think about what the challenges are and how they, um, kind of do that progression. Yeah, because there's no uh, unique way of doing that. It's it's yeah. kind of tricky to to come up with something that is realistic enough, uh, computationally tractable, uh, and the solution should make sense. And then in this type of settings where it's not only about a solution, but how you're going to implement that too, as you mentioned. Yeah. So it's yeah. uh, a, a lot of things to to care about, and it's absolutely yeah. challenging for one to come up with something really neat and and good, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, and then you can see the value of it. You know, going back to the school example, you know, really engaging the whole community in this conversation, right? So getting them to think about what has this 60 years of a policy of busing students out of one neighborhood meant in terms of, you know, we'd come up with metrics like, what is the likelihood that you have someone on your block in your same grade at the same school? And, and the likelihood is very different by race and ethnicity. And so getting the community to kind of think about this isn't just anecdotes that you're hearing, we can really quantify how pervasive this is. And that I think really brought people around to want to, because change is hard, change means we might lose something. And so how do we think about it as a bigger picture? Yeah, you 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 bring also awareness to the community. When you're, yep. you're modeling these type of problems and you need their feedback, you also need to provide them feedback too, right? They, yeah. they should understand yeah. what's going on and what what is the, uh, the science or the rationale behind the decisions and so on, right? It's a fascinating yeah. application, uh, it's indeed, right? Um, you have also made contributions in the field of humanitarian logistics in the context of healthcare scheduling, equity, and so on. Uh, could you briefly comment on such contributions? Yeah, so one of the projects that um, I worked on a number of years ago um, with my colleagues here with uh, Sayed Ravani and with Songeo, who's now at um, ISB, we worked with a mobile asthma care provider in Chicago, and that was a really great project. It was a great, um, great partnership in terms of they were really willing to think outside the box and think about again how do they make the best use of their operations. And that was you know talking about this equity in outcome versus out equity in inputs it was really a case of how do you think about asthma, you know. Uh, if you just go to your, if you have asthma and you go to your doctor, then they might have a preferred frequency with which you come to visit. But when it's a community outreach and you don't have the resources to see every patient with that preferred frequency, how do you think about allocating resources for the greater community good to think about at a population level, how do we keep asthma in check? So it requires not only making these allocation decisions, but also modeling the asthma progression. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, fascinating and really relevant work. Uh, and what type of methods do you apply in general to solve the problems you have just described? Uh -huh. So for that, it was kind of a mix of, you know, there's the allocation, but then there's also the, you know, using uh, uh, MDPs to think about the progression, the disease progression. And, um, and, and there was also one of the really interesting things. Uh, is by that MDP, you mean Markov decision processes for the Markov listeners who are not really process. familiar yeah. with. Yeah. 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 Yes. So then part of it also is like, how do we prove the process of Markovian? You know, how do we think about, do we really have the properties of an MDP? The other thing that was really interesting is we had an amazing uh, data set from, from this provider. So we had all of this operational and clinical data on, um, on the patients. But one of the big challenges was we had 
really a missing data problem because they weren't seen with constant frequency. So you didn't know necessarily how their asthma was evolving over time. So kind of thinking about how do you come up with an algorithm to fill in those missing data points, right? So one patient might have been seen um, the next month and then three months later and then two months later and another patient not for six months. And so how do we start to come up with a common way to, to do this? Um, it was really challenging. And now what I love is going back to that work and explaining that to my MBAs and getting them to think of, you know, really, uh, it's kind of a hard concept, but once you can kind of step them through what this means, it's it's been really fun. Yeah, so you're really all over the place because uh, I know you have used optimization and then now MDPs. And so depending on the context, you, you try to come up with the right uh, method yeah. or tool to properly address them, right? And that's why I love to collaborate and why I love being in an IE department here because I, you know, Renee, you know, the work that I'm doing right now with um, uh, substandard pharmaceuticals in uh, resource constrained countries. So this was a project there um, uh, was a woman at Notre Dame, a chemist who reached out to me um, because she had these low cost devices to uh, look at the quality of pharmaceuticals and she wanted to have a supply chain perspective on it so we um, worked on an NSF project together but as we were working on it I realized it wasn't actually the way that I was thinking of modeling was not really exactly what we needed so I brought in my colleague Matt Plumley, and then he started working on it so it's been really neat to think about you know as you're doing applied OR sometimes you need to bring in a set of skills that are not in your necessarily in your wheelhouse and how do you uh, just yeah have those connections. Yeah, so to I mean, work. for me, it's pretty clear that you have a knack for problem solving. And, and that's, <laughs> that's just great. Uh, so Karen, uh, how did you manage to remain quite productive after having kids? <laughs> you know, one thing I always like to tell people is, um, I'm really proud of my CV, because it, it isn't straight. It isn't linear, you can see when my children were born. You know, and now you'll at some point you'll see the pandemic and the impact of having my children at home during the pandemic. But you also see it go back up. And I tell people that you don't need to keep it all the time. You don't need to be a superhero and you can find what works for you. You know, find a balance that allows you to do what you do. You know, my, my students would come to my PhD students would come to my house when I had my kids. Uh, which is actually a really funny story because my kids now assume that like every adult has a 20-ish year old grad student who works them so you know their nanny's nephew came and they're like oh is that her her grad student and they just thought <laughs> everyone has grad students um but but I, I think it's important because i think i you know i always want to be careful of the message we send to junior faculty and it isn't that i was always productive through it it wasn't that i was like you know changing a diaper and writing computer code at the same time. I wasn't. And and there was certainly a time when you could see I had kids and that meant I was less productive, but that's okay because I'm back in it now. And yeah, the pandemic for parents was really hard. And and if you're an assistant professor right now or a PhD student who's really struggling because the pandemic, when you had kids at home, was really, really hard, you know, reach out to your university for resources because I think we need to support faculty through this time or we're going to lose a whole lot of really good people. Yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right and I agree with you. Um, so before we talk about your editorial activity um, regarding transportation science, yep. I have to ask about the influence of Martin Salzberg in your career. Yes, um, so Martin has just uh, such a big influence on my life. Um, so when I was an assistant professor, I invited Martin to give a talk. I think I might have called him Marty in the first email, which is a little embarrassing, <laughs> which is another lesson to do your faculty that you can survive embarrassing things. But I'm pretty sure I said, dear Marty. <laughs> it's funny. Um, so he came and I um, had been doing some work on uh, drayage. In remote. So drayage is, um, you know, it's, here in Chicago, we have a lot of rail yards coming into Chicago and a lot of the containers need to be moved either between the rail yards or to their consignees somewhere in Chicago. So they go on truck. And so there's a big routing of, um, of drayage. And so as part of this large project and my part was the routing of, of drayage. And as a civil engineer, the way that I was presenting it was very application focused, very much about like, I think I called it the Chicago drayage program or drayage problem. And Mar I invited Martin to come give a talk 
he gave a great talk. And then we started talking about my work. He went to his hotel that night, came back the next day and had really helped me. Re He's like, we have to think about this differently. You have to generalize it from just Chicago drainage to a multi-resource routing problem. That's what it is. And we sat at my desk and we worked it out. And it was just so influential to me. Um, we did a symposium, uh, Natasha Bowen and I, for Martin in Australia a number of years ago for his birthday. And I found my presentation of this work before Martin's visit and my presentation after. And it was so neat just to see how much things had improved with, with uh, his influence. Yeah. You spent a time in Australia, right? I did. I did. So that was fantastic. So about uh, 12 years ago now, I was on sabbatical um, at... Uh, University of Newcastle, Newcastle, Australia, with visiting Martin, and it was just an incredible, incredible time. Yeah. Um, how did you become editor in chief of Transportation Science? So I have been an associate editor for the journal for a long time, and over time, I started becoming the go-to person for papers that maybe weren't going to make it out to review. And this started with Michelle Gendro, I, I believe. Um, because I think it's important that even if a paper is going to be returned without review, that something that we, you know, the authors should get some feedback on their work and why. Uh, so I think that that kind of kept me really busy uh, doing that. But then also just I even papers that do go out for review, I really enjoy the process of finding the right reviewers, really thinking about the work and is there a path forward for this, this paper and, and how do we present that clearly. So yeah, when I um, was nominated, I you know, talked to a lot of uh, former editors in chief. I also talked to Alice Smith, um, which got great advice from her on her experience at IJOC. You know, one of the big challenges that we faced at the journal was it was, I mean, it's a great thing, the journal's growing a lot. And so one of the things that Martin really wanted us to do was revisit our editorial structure because at the time we just had editor in chief and then all associate editors. Um, but many of the larger journals that informs will then also have either department or area editors. Uh, it's a hard thing, especially, you know, at transportation science, how do we divide up into areas? How do we think about this? And so um, Martin and I, so, you know, I said, if you choose me to be editor in chief, I'd like to start the process before so that when I start on January 1st, we have the new structure in place. So I was chosen, which I really appreciate. Um, and then Martin and I started a committee that summer, the June before I, I became editor in chief, where we really mapped out the entire process, what the areas would be. We identified the area editors, the review process, all of that. Um, we worked on the, the back end in Scholar One so that everything launched on January 1st. Yeah, a lot of work. Uh, it worked. <laughs> yeah. You guys have adopted a hard deadline policy, correct? Yes. Yep. Yep. So one of the things that, um, you know, when I first came in, and it, one of the really neat thing, well, there's so many neat things about the new area structure, but it means I have five area editors that are just always there to give input. And so Barry Thomas, who is one of the area editors from Logistics and Routing, said, let's look at the papers that are really you know, just, just been in review eight months, nine months. And there, there weren't very many, but there were a few. And so we got, you know, got them through. And then we decided hard deadline, you know, and, and six months when you think about it, if you think about all of the chunks of time along the process, it shouldn't take six months. Most papers are like our mean and median or somewhere about three and a half months. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and this paper is going out for review. So this is, you know, if you exclude the desk rejects. So most papers, four months, is plenty of time but some papers you know they might take a while to um find reviewers it might be that it's submitted you know in the summer when people are on vacation what the six month hard deadline does is it holds us accountable and it really gives us a way to say to the associate editors we've got to get this through and um and people the everyone's been great you know we've had papers that are challenging for a number of reasons and we all pitch in and i know that i'm the one driving this so that means more work on my part and i will do i'll say i'll be your extra reviewer i'll be you know whatever you need i'll be the air the associate editor or the air, whatever step is missing i will help out um, and it's been great because it also allows us to be more proactive, that we can see like, okay, the paper was submitted a month ago and we don't have enough reviewers, move on that. Or we're now at four months and we're, this person has been six weeks late on their review, we need them to get this in. So it's, you know, I have a weekly meeting with a managing editor and it's not, most of the time the papers are all fine, but it allows us to find these hard papers before they become a problem. 
because I can't have, I cannot go to a reviewer at five months and three weeks and say, oh, I forgot to tell you, we have a six month deadline. You need to do this tomorrow because that's not fair, right? If you're going to have the six month deadline, you need to tell people that four months, we have this, this is coming in two months. I'm going to need you to turn this around or tell me if you can't. So a lot of it is just about communication, that if you're going to change the expectations of reviewers, of associate editors, of authors, you know, we changed, we had now our page limits. Um, you just need to be clear and fair. And so that we do have page limits now because if we're going to ask more of our reviewers, we shouldn't ask them to read 80 page papers. Mm -hmm. So we also now have a page limit. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so do you prefer associate editors who are fast or those who are not so fast, but more thoughtful? Uh, thoughtful, right? I mean, you know, we have, I, you know, I, I think that at the end of the day, we need to provide the authors with thoughtful, informed feedback on their work. And so, um, and, and I think that, you know, fortunately it's not really a choice. I think everyone, between the two, everyone's been doing both. I think, the, I think we've been really good about providing feedback, which is important because there's certain times you may not know, you know, so one of the things, um, we started doing is this thank you letter. After you review a paper, the reviewers get information. They see all the reviews. And and I'll write a little note if it was a decision that seems different than what they might expect. I'll explain why we made the decision. Because people don't necessarily know what makes a good review when they start reviewing. So I think we have a responsibility of informing the reviewers. So we adopted, you know, Chris Tang, when he was editor in chief of management of MSUM, put in a lot of amazing changes, really focused on informing reviewers and authors about the process. And so one of the things we adopted from MSUM is a template for reviewers to really get them to focus on the key issues and not just give us a laundry list of everything they didn't like. Mm -hmm. So how to become an associate editor uh, of transportation science? Ah, be a very good reviewer. So at the end of, so one of the things we also did was we, um, implemented service awards for both reviewers and associate editors. So at the end of the year, I get nominations um, for the service award. And I also look through, you know, we try to encourage the AEs to rank, uh, to rate their um, reviewers. And I read the reviews and I just look at like, okay, what is, um, who's doing really good work, editorial work. And we just keep a running list um, with the area editors. And I have a running list of people that we have our eyes on, like, oh, this person's really good, but they haven't reviewed a lot for the journal. So then we'll ask associate editors, like, or, could you get this person to review? Because we want to see how they do. We're also mindful. I mean, Margaret Brandau's work on- um, Who are the gatekeepers? Diversity. Yeah. Yes, is fantastic, right? And yeah. so I think that we use that now. We've got, when we look at our editorial board, thinking about are we making sure that we are um, diversifying along a number of dimensions? Yeah, Karen. So, uh, how to address the issue of uh, diversity and equity uh, when choosing editors to be part of the board, of the journal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, so I mentioned we, we have a running list. And so we really look at who do we have our eye on and we try to solicit as much feedback as possible. Um, what I will do, so when any paper comes across my desk to um, approve the decision of the area editor, I look at the reviews and if there's a review that I really like, put the person's name down because what we want is to have this really deep pool of possible associate editors because we want to think about the balance as we're choosing um, and making sure, you know, geographically. It's interesting, people get, there's one misconception is that, you know, it's all folks from Montreal. It's not, <laughs> we definitely are not. <laughs> so, I mean, and I have now the data to back it up to look at where our associate editors come from. Uh, and so we just think about, you know, more broadly and, and really encouraging associate editors now to give us feedback who did a really good job who should we be looking at and i would say that broadly to everyone you know if you are reading a paper in transportation site or anywhere and you're like i this person's really good let me know and even if they don't review for the journal now we'll put them on our watch list we'll make sure they get invited to review papers so it's it's got to be an active process it can't simply be let's see who's in our immediate view because then it's going to stay really closed and, and that's kind of margaret's paper, right? Is if we look too closely, we don't think outside and we need to really broaden how we're looking for. Um, yeah. Otherwise, we'll fall into the click 
problems, right? We stay within certain groups. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and not afraid to give people feedback. You know, I think that sometimes like, oh, well, that review wasn't very good or that AA report wasn't very good. I'm not going to go to them again. Let them know. Say, this is what, can you, can you change your, you know, can you add more to your exp explanation of why you're rejecting or major revision this paper? So give people feedback so they have a chance to grow into these positions because it isn't just associate editors. Now we need to think about what's our track for area editors, area editor in chief, like making sure we have that pipeline. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with angry authors? Uh, did you have any bad experience to the point of ruining your day? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you know, I at first will always start in the, you know, um, welcoming the email and understanding their frustration and then talking them through. Uh, we're very fortunate that one of Chris Tank's first initiatives as VP of Publications at Informs was to have more journals standardize their appeal process. And so we, we did, and, and Chris is just amazing because he sends you a list of, here's all the journals, here's what their policies are. So the area editors and I, you know, looked at, at the material, drafted our own policy for transportation science. And it does have a minimum amount of time now before you, you have to wait two weeks before you can submit an appeal. And it also spells out what makes an, a good, you know, appeal can only be on technical issues. It can't just be that you think they didn't appreciate your work. So spelling all this out, I think is really good because it gives people a chance to really think back and like, do I have a case here to go back for an appeal? Maybe I, I'm just upset and maybe this is not actually an appeal. But then the opposite is true. I think there are some authors who probably should appeal sometimes. You know, I'm not saying that we get everything right. You know, I know that we don't get everything right all the time. And I think Chris's um, goal is to make it more transparent, that if you look at who appeals decisions, it's not a uniform random sample. You can imagine who appeals decisions and how do we change that? How do we allow junior faculty when they think their uh, work was not read correctly, not assigned to the right reviewers, that something was misunderstood, that they do have recourse. And I think that that's important. And that gets into the, to, to you know, DEI more broadly of how do we make it all fair for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no secret that reviewers and even editors can be very biased when evaluating a paper. Uh, mm -hmm. While one may see this as something vir virtually unavoidable, uh, what can be done to make things more fair in this sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we've talked about double blind. I think the issue with double blind is you can figure out who the authors are, right? There's ways when you do your references that people know, and especially now with like archive and optimization online, you can find the authors pretty easily if you wanted to. So I think it goes back to processes, you know, and I think that that's where these templates are really important, you know, so that you don't see a paper come all the way through the system with very light reviews and a minor revision because it's someone very senior, right? So then the area editors, the associate editors really pushing back and saying, no, tell me why, what is it you like about this paper? Or when a paper is rejected, uh, maybe because English is not the first language, but could you get past that, right? If we talk, if we work with the authors and get them to, to fix the English and the presentation, maybe there's really good ideas there. So how do you think about what these biases are and have a consistent way of evaluating papers so that we, like you said, everyone has biases and we need to acknowledge them and think about how do we come up with more fair systems to to acknowledge them and address them yeah uh, what about you uh how do you feel when you need to reject papers from people you know i hate it <laughs> and that you know but in some ways that drives me to make our review process better right because every time i send a rejection i know i've ruined someone's day right it, you just have so how do you make sure that there's something in that in the feedback that's helpful that it's not, um, the language isn't disrespectful. I think that's really important. I think we need to respect that this is the work that people put a lot of time in. Um, people are not submitting to our journal to annoy us. <laughs> you know, This is work that they're really proud of. So I think that, you know, making sure you can justify it. I mean, I just sent a decision back to an associate editor this week because they said, I don't think that the specialist and the person agreed and said, okay, let me think through this more. So I think that we need to not just push things through that come across our desk, but stop and think about and And, you know, the way the system is right now, everything comes from me. You know, even though the area editors really 
they're empowered to make their decisions. I very rarely go against their decisions, but it's my name. <laughs> you know, when the, the complaining emails come, they come to me. So I have to feel comfortable that I could defend this. And I also need the associate editors and the area editors and the reviewers to know I will have their back. You know, when an author complains, I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, that associate editor, what an idiot, right? Because <laughs> I believe in the work of everyone who supports the journal. And so I think it's important, too, that they know that I'm not going to throw them under the bus and be like, oh, that person really messed up. So it's, you know, it's just, you know, but also acknowledging that we do make mistakes sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We all do. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, you are the person who writes the cutest rejection letters I've ever seen. Uh, I had the chance to see that when reviewing papers for transportation science that, that ended up being rejected, of course. I hope I don't get one of those when I <laughs> submit uh, uh, my papers, but uh, uh, that's a very uh, nice gesture. I think we need more people doing uh, things yeah. similar like that. I mean, I think, you know, a big part of DEI that gets forgotten is the I part, the inclusion. And, and we don't need... You can, re you can have a standard for the quality of papers without demoralizing people. And, 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 and also I think that the work often has a good, it has potential and it's just not there yet, right? And so making sure that that's communicated in the rejection letters. Yeah. Uh, so Karen, what's your take regarding the use of chat GPT in scientific writing and, and what is the policy of transportation science when it comes to using generative AI to help authors producing their manuscripts? Yeah, uh, we don't have an official policy yet, but we will be working on this. And I would say at the moment, everything just has to be acknowledged, right? If you, you use, you know, uh, the work on schools that my student and I are doing, we use ChatGPT to come up with names for t fictitious elementary schools, which was super fun. So if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, but I think that if you're using ChatGPT to write your paper, no. And if you're using it to improve your writing, you need to tell us and be upfront about it. And then it's up for us to decide if that's acceptable or not. I do think, and, and I think, you know, again, having Chris as VP of publications, I'm sure, you know, I this is, I think there's certain things where we really need to have a consistent informed journal um, policy. And I really am so thankful to be part of the suite of informed journals because when difficult conversations like what we're gonna do about AI and ChatGPT come up that we can, really collectively talk about our experiences and what we're going to do. Yeah, and and what your kids think about ChatGPT? Do you know, uh, they, well, they saw the South Park episode, which I then used to explain to my parents what, what ChatGPT, my parents hadn't heard about ChatGPT, so I showed them the South Park episode, which is problematic in other ways. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, they're aware of it and they, you know, talk about it. And so, you know, how do we get them to think about what is their own work versus uh, AI? It's it's something. It's going to change the way everything is, right? I mean, it can, you know, one thing we're going to have to wrestle is it's not just writing the paper, it's writing the code. We write ample code now, right? It can write uh, our code. So how do you know who did the code of the work? But then what do we value? If we do have software now that could write better, more efficient code than us, what is the contribution? So how do we think about as, you know, how do we save humanity by thinking about what our contributions still are? I don't think that ChatGPT can write rejection letters like I do. But yeah. we'll see. If that's coming, then I need to worry. I totally agree. Uh, Karen, what can we expect from you in the coming years? Um, I think there's still a lot more to do at the journal, which is really exciting. I think one thing that we are, we need, one of my goals is to think about getting, you know, why certain papers go to journals that aren't TS. And I think one is business schools. And as more folks in transportation and logistics go to business schools, they have their journal list. And if TS is not on that journal list, they're not going to um, uh, submit to our journal. So how do we work on that? I think having a joint appointment in a business school helps me with that. Um, but that's definitely a goal for the journal uh, and just, I think there's so much exciting work in, in transportation. I think looking uh, more at sustainability, at access to transportation. Transportation is, you know, for so many, provides access to education, to jobs. And how do we make sure that with this new technology, it is universally accessible and not just accessible to those who can afford it? So I think that's exciting. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's. Uh, it's exciting times ahead. Yeah, looking forward to reading your future papers for sure on the topic. 
you have done uh, a fantastic work uh, on you know using OR to solve many problems in logistics, transportation, and in non profit settings and so on. So I'm sure uh, there should be nice work coming up uh, in the next years. Okay, Thank Karen, you so much. it was absolutely fantastic to have you here. I had so much fun. Uh, I'm sorry if I bombarded you with too many questions regarding your editorial activity, but you know, it's, I think it's- uh, But obviously you know what I like talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it was uh, great. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for doing this. You know, I know I said this earlier, but I think when we focus on that I and that inclusion, subject to plays a big part. And I really appreciate efforts like this. And I can, just seeing how much work you put in just for you and me today, this must be such a huge effort. And I, it's not trivial. And I don't know if people appreciate, you know, when you just listen to subject to, it's just fun to sit back and listen and not think about all of the work that you're putting in to do this. And so thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's I, I strongly appreciate your words. Uh, and it's like working on a short survey paper, let's say, uh, where you have to, you know, uh, survey the, the, the life of the guests in a way. So but um, for me, it's a pleasure. And, and I get really excited when I get this lovely feedback. Uh, so uh, for me, it's like giving me energy to keep going on. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Karen, uh, if you're coming to Brazil, uh, please consider visiting us. Uh, we'll be very happy to have you. And uh, I wish you all the best and take care and bye. Ciao. Thank you. Too. Bye bye.